Our topic today is member experience, and it's a huge topic for all of us. Our lives have changed drastically in the recent years, and so much so that sometimes we're not even aware of how it's changed. The way your members experience you has also changed. Uh, they used to visit the branch and use the ATMs and the online banking to fill in some of the gaps. And today, now, they want to be mobile. Uh, they manage their friendships via social media, and when they're shopping, they move seamlessly from online to in-store to mobile to social. So is it any wonder why we want new options for accessing our banking? Today, we have for you several great speakers. And uh, we want to ask some big questions out of our speakers. What do your members want? How have their demands changed? How can credit unions connect and engage? And where does a credit union fit in this entire picture? Our speakers today have insight to share on all these topics. And so without further ado, I'd like to bring out our first speaker. Our first speaker is today is from MasterCard, so please join me in welcoming Kevin Rowland. Thank you. I think I'm on, on, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Chris, I appreciate that. Um, how many of you have your mobile phones with you today? Okay, this is the only session you're gonna hear this. Make sure they're on. Make sure that uh, you're looking at them when you need to, when I ask you questions. I don't want anyone having to do the mobile prayer where you have the phone down and you're trying to hide from me while you're talking on your phone and you're praying to your mobile phone. So keep them out and open uh, because this is a dialogue about digital commerce. So obviously I want you to use those smart devices. And how many people do have, raise your hands, who has at least one, maybe two, one mobile smartphone? Two, three, four, <laughs> three. I mean, five years ago, we would have said zero. That's pretty amazing. I am Kevin Rowland. I'm here with Chris Inslee from MasterCard. We're both out of the Atlanta office, and we're talking about the digital commerce future of the payments, of pay payments. That's my get out of jail free card, my legal disclosure. So understanding the digital landscape, why do I need a digital plan? First of all, before I get into the digital space and before I talk about plan, does anyone know what this is? Yeah. Yeah. A-Track. Would you give her a prepaid card? <laughs> this is the same technology that your MagStripe cards use today. So I don't know how many of you, how many of you use this for music today? <laughs> but your credentials on your MagStripe card are out on this technology. This is the Moody Blues, by the way, so I had to get it from my mother's attic, so. <laughs> but I just want, that's, to me, is a compelling story of how we need to update our ecosystem with EMV as a foundation and digital commerce. So why do I need a digital plan? First of all, who thinks they need a plan? Okay, and, and who has a plan today? Awesome. So Chris and I are from the city of Atlanta, and you may remember we had a really warm winter this year. And the city was well prepared for any type of weird situations, right? So that was the ninth largest city in the country, with five and a half million people who sat still because they didn't have a plan. Now, I'm not saying anything catastrophic like this is going to happen because you don't have a mobile plan or you don't upgrade to EMV. But I'm saying that if something like this happened, that was two inches of snow and a little bit of ice. So we all sat in our homes and we were not sitting on the highway for four, three or four days. So that's why we really need to have a plan because change is inevitable. So with your mobile phones ready, who can look up what that word is and tell me what it means? No, more, no mobile phone. It's the fear of being out without a mobile phone. She's like Hermione Granger. She knows the answer. <laughs> Very good. Give her a prepaid card as well. So would you repeat that? That was a really good answer. It's the fear of being without any, having any mobile phone or mobile uh -huh. abilities. That's exactly right. That's actually a diagnosis now that psychiatrists use for the anxiety that's created when people leave the house without their mobile device. Have you ever had that? I know I have. I, would, if, I will drive back home to get my mobile phone. Yeah. So, you know, the next generation millennials are 10 times worse. And they're our next generation of consumers that are using our products in credit unions. And they're not 12 years old anymore. They were born after 1980. So they're 30 years old. And so think about that. They are your next generation of customers. 
and they're driven very differently than maybe some of us, like me, who is a baby boomer, who whatever the credit union gave to me, I got my free checking, I was very happy. These guys aren't so happy. They have to have it now, based on their behavior, and that's the only way they take it. So anyway, that's nomophobia. So what we're seeing in the digital space today is an acceleration across very different channels and devices. We're seeing tap and go in the aisle, in app, online, even Google Glasses, where people can transact and use their d digital devices. And that could be tablets or mobile phones. What we're also seeing is a huge growth in the amount of space that mobile devices take over e-commerce. So a lot of that was all online, on, in web, and you can see almost 7% growth projected in the next three years. So if you think about it, smartphones came out, not just flip phone, but smartphones came out in 2007. So that mass adoption in seven years, right? So that adoption is probably twice as fast as it was for the TV and the microwave to become normalized. So can you imagine how quickly this is, this number will probably be dwarfed, I would guess, by the next three years. But that's a projection at least by Glenbrook at this point. So it's very simple, safe, and smart. That's what you've got to give consumers today. They all understand the target breach. They all understand that they're looking to you, not the retailers, to keep their credentials safe. And whether that's on a card or in a mobile device with tokenization, credentials have to be kept safe and simple for them to use. And they're not dumb. They can figure out how these things work. It's not hard to figure out EMV. It won't be hard for them to figure out the mobile device. How many of you have given your phone to a 15-year-old when you want to figure out how to download an app or something? <laughs> exactly right. They get it. They get it. So enhanced security. Uh, there's continuing consumer concerns over how we keep our credentials safe, uh, especially in CNP. Where's Rosemary, my jargon lady? If I said CNP, card not present, where'd she go? She must. There she is. Card not present. Make sure she gets one back there. Card not present fraud. That's where the fraudsters are going. Once they get the in uh, data encrypted on an EMV, the fraudsters will go to some other place. They'll go to the mobile devices where the card's not present. So it's kind of like you want to make sure that if you get robbed, you get a dog, you get an alarm. It may not prevent 100%. It won't be a silver bullet, but they'll go to someone else's house. So make sure that security is part of your plan. Um, we are seeing a lower approval rates on the card not present and merchant breaches. You hear about them all the time. You're enabling better experiences, faster checkouts, value-added integration with rewards and loyalty, uh, immersive shopping, and consistency across all channels. So credit unions and technology. So the key is investing in our technology that gives greater value to your DDA. How do you drive folks to experience a better DDA besides just a free checking account? They can get a mobile app that downloads that they can use for faster checkout, online checkout. It's all geared around enhancing the DDA. So what is a mobile wallet? It's basically the physical wallet, which you see on the left, moved to a mobile device. And it literally is just that, your card credentials, where it's your cards, or you know, however you want to set up your wallet, it's up to you. I mean, you could have it exclusively for your credit union, or you could say, I allow other products in there. It's a container that holds the cards that are held in a mobile device. And then exchanging with merchants through tokenization enables the primary account number, the PAN, to not be out in the clear. It's encrypted. And that's the next evolution of digital wallets. This is graphic show. So basically, you see the chip card on the left that's been basically loaded into a mobile wallet on the mobile device that can be used at the point of sale, online, or via in-app. So basically, what you're seeing is a transition of wallets into the digital space using the tokenization gateway. Does that make sense, tokenization, what we're trying to do with that? That's basically saying, when you have the mobile device, and you have your card credentials on the phone, you want that to be encrypted, whether that's in the secure element of the phone or what you might be hearing lately is host card emulation. And that's a tricky one. And that is where you take your credentials and put it in the cloud. So if you have your music, let's say today, on iPad or iPod, you might want to put it in the cloud. It's the same type of, of functionality. You're encrypting your data and putting it into the cloud so that it's not in the clear. What are we trying to do is avoid disintermediation. Try saying that fast 10 times. The players on the right are all looking for your business. They're all technology companies, but they're not 
in the retail credit union space. They don't understand lending, they don't understand risk, but they're trying. They're trying to figure it out and trying to figure it out quickly. So if you go to a class of 18 year olds and ask them how many have a bank or credit union account, they may not raise their hand, but they all have a PayPal account because they're all playing games, right? And that becomes the graduation when they, after they go to school and after they become adults. So how do we disintermediate the PayPals and get that relationship back? Because that's the key is you really have the relationship. You know the people that you talk to every day. PayPal doesn't know that, but they're trying to figure it out. So the key is, is how to build your plan, just disintermediate these guys and keep them out of your space and actually grow value with the proposal and the products you have today. I think the digital space with EMV as your foundation is probably the best way to go. But each of you have to have your own plan. It's really up to you. And the folks at Co-op are very good, very good at keeping up with the latest in technology. You may have heard of their Sprig product. Uh, we're looking at ways that we can help integrate with that. And I think that's a great solution that you could put your logo into their wallet and you don't have to host the technology or it's up to you. If you have an IT staff that would love to host a, you know, a wallet, then you can do it that way as well. So it's pretty flexible either way. So pretty much that's, that's the high level. I wanted to give more time for you to have, ask questions versus me just stand up here and talk because I can talk all day and it doesn't do you any good. So, all right, John. How do we get the regulatory regime to treat the non-traditional competitors how they treat us to even that playing field? Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's gonna be interesting to see how that happens. They, they've done a good job at keeping uh, themselves out of that fray. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is exactly yet. We'll have to see how this evolves. But uh, I would think that as they get more into the lending spot, that's where we're going to see the more regulatory. Really probably what will happen is there'll end up being some type of, of incident that causes them to react versus be proactive. That's what I've seen in the past, but you know, we'll have to wait and see. That's not a good answer, but that's all I have right now. Yes. Just thinking about this, I don't know if I can say it, disintermediation. Mm -hmm. uh, we really need to get our younger folks involved with our credit union. And how do we go about, how can we uh, help them understand the value of something like this? How, how do we market it? You, you market to where they are. So they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook. So hopefully your credit union has a, a Facebook page. Um, Anywhere social media, you know, that's where they're at right now. I mean, I, I don't know all the different websites and all the different media channels that uh, millennials use, but uh, that, that's where you hit them because they're not coming into the branches. That's right. just not, they don't need to come into the branches. And banking's right. not fun. What's that? Banking's not fun. Not fun, so yeah. For that generation at all. So yeah, make you know, it fun. You, you can be on social, but it doesn't mean you're able to attract them and engage and interact with them. Yeah, you know, maybe a QR code stuck in a mall somewhere where they can like scan it and get a free something out of it. You make a game out of it and it seems to really work. I mean, we like to play games. I mean, we're playing games here. You know, there's lots of things going on. So it's, it's usually social media that seems to be the best channel. And we have a whole study on youth and millennials. If you're interested in hearing about that on how you market to that group, I'd uh, be glad to do that. Because really, if you think about that, you know, you had the... Uh, uh, baby boomers and the kids after that. This is the next generation, so this is a big peak of people. And as more people are retiring, the baby boomers and the millennials are becoming really the, kind of the primary uh, folks that we lend to and, and transact with. So you've got to understand how to work with them. And again, they're not you know, 12 to 18 years old anymore. Oh yeah. Uh, just um, QR codes, are you seeing success with that? Because we are not. Yeah, I mean, yeah. in Atlanta we do. Yes. Yeah, it, well, it's it's hard to tell. There's a lot of players out there. I know Level Up in Atlanta is a big market. You know, if you're going to a lot of different uh, little restaurants around town, you'll see the Level Up QR code, and you pay just holding your phone up to the right. QR code. That's it. So it's simple, yeah. But it, it's probably regional. It's probably by segmentation. It's like the EMV. It's not necessarily you know, normalized yet, but it is in certain sectors like uh, government channels, education, anyone that travels, you know, even to Canada or what, you know, Canada's EMV compliant now. So it really is more a segment type of play versus a mainstream type of play at this point. But it doesn't hurt to have those, that type of technology in your marketing materials to say, you know, we use QR codes, see our social media sites, see our Twitter, whatever it is, at least you're responding to that demographic. Even if you don't have everything built out yet, at least have a plan, a strategy to go after that market. Because a lot of people aren't yet, and it's a wide open field. 
And then, you know, if PayPal has the breach, like we've seen with some of the retailers, that's going to change a lot of opinions really fast. So you just need to be ready to take on that type of uh, opportunity. So, so I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying, but I'm having to think about it differently. And, and in one case, you know, you're saying make, make your card the first card, your mm -hmm. card of choice. The challenge really is it's two, there's two different channels that you're really worried about. On the one side, you're worrying about the targets who do an ACH and, and the, the, the people who go to Target say, gosh, I love that because I get a 5% discount. And that's a hard game to fight. In fact, it's almost impossible um, from the sense of your card. You're not going to fight that and win it because their perceived value that Target's providing goes well beyond anything that your card's going to provide or anything that our card has been able to provide. On the other hand, with PayPal and some of the others, you know, our number one goal is get our card to be the card that they associate to that PayPal account or that, that, that debit card to that PayPal account so that we're getting the interchange for the debit as long as the interchange lasts. But we're also the card of choice. And the challenge there is, of course, as you reissue cards or as the date expires, they, they have every three years or whatever your cycle is to change that card. How are you guys battling some of that? Because I don't, I don't actually believe we're going to be able to win that war. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I, I think we have to take strategy beyond that, uh, beyond simply let's be the only card in their wallet or the first card in their wallet. We've got to be thinking about how do we make it to where once they associate your card to that PayPal account or some of those other accounts, they don't have to change that card every three years. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, on the ACH side, you know, one of the things that at some point I think that the big banks will figure out is, you know, how do you charge, you know, Target for those ACH transactions that they're getting for free today? So how do you see people addressing those? Yeah, I see that, uh, first of all, you've got the core account. I mean, you've got the starting, and I, don't, I want to make sure I've got all your points there. Yeah, I make a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the loyalty is to the people you know. You know, Target may get the 5%, but there are probably loyalty programs that you can tie back to your DDA. You know, lots of things you can do. I mean, we have programs today, like, you know, merchant-funded rewards, like the Fuel Rewards Network. There's other type of free network type of programs. Okay. But to be perfectly, you know, honest yeah. with you, when they're standing in line at Target and they see a five percent discount, there's an emotional um, appeal to that. They go, they're not thinking about your reward program. Yeah. They're, they're thinking about five percent discount off that bill. So what if you had a program that drove cash back to your DDA account that you could actually see the cash go back in when you look up your balance at night? Because that's that is that's not new technology today. That's five percent's a big chunk. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if you compete with the 5%. It's, t it's tough to compete with the Walmarts and the Targets. That's a, that's a compelling offer. But you do have that opportunity that you can actually drive it back to the DDA. We've seen a lot of evidence where that seems to be appealing to people. They like to see that cash go right back in their DDA account. So it's, you know, it's a matter of choice and how you market it. Yeah. I know that's not probably the answer you want, but... No, that's okay. Okay. That's an answer. <laughs> Anyone else? Any type of questions? Get uh, the mic to it. We haven't quite, we haven't quite figured this out. But um, if you ask the consumer what they would rather have compromised, would it be the card or the actual checking account? That kind of we don't usually think of it that way. But if you could get the consumer to kind of understand that, um, I think they'd be a lot more willing to use that card versus, okay, here's I'm giving Target who just got in a lot of trouble and I gave them all my checking account information and my account information versus just a device that's easily swapped out. Yeah. Yeah, that's a compelling message. In fact, we're coming out in July. In fact, the marketing materials will be out now on zero liability enhancements. We're increasing that and also ID theft so that and those are free benefits that we're offering to uh, customers who have their MasterCard accounts and members. So. Uh, but it, that is that does drive the point home is that's money coming out of your DDA and, and it's information coming out of your DDA. And even though on the target breach that EMV card may not have uh, prevented that transaction from being fraudulent, it would have perhaps stopped the counterfeit card fraud that goes on afterwards. And in fact, it's fraud we don't even know about yet. In fact, if you look at the counterfeit fraud across the globe, 23% of the volume comes from the U.S., but 45% of counterfeit fraud comes from here. And it's, and it's because we don't have the messaging you're talking about where EMV and protecting the DDA and, and protecting your credentials. It's not just about, oh, I'll get my money back. It's about your identities out in, in, in Russia or Turkey or China being replicated somewhere. 
and that's how it goes. It usually gets the data to someplace like you know Russia, where they make the files in Turkey, and the cards go out in China. I mean, that's how fast they can replicate that information. And EMV stops that. It at least lets the crooks go somewhere else. But I think that's a compelling message that you mentioned there. Yeah, that's the right way to do it. There's some speculation about EMV that it would take anywhere from five to ten years to actually complete it. And I just wanted your insight as to how you get the merchants um, enabled, the little nail shops, and how do you get that you know, to change. And then um, because it's going to take so long, and the speculation is why spend the time and resources on that and instead focus more on the Google type wallets, the mobile, the wallets yeah. environment? Well, you, you've seen that uh, if you might look at some of like the Target, Walmart, Macy's terminals today, they are putting those uh, EMV enabled terminals in today. And if you take the top 24 largest merchants in the U.S., they comprise about 90% of the merchant volume. Now, they're not 90% of the, of the terminals, but 24 of the top merchants comprise 90% of the volume. So once those 24 go, and they're compliant with EMV readers, and you have a MagStripe card, next October, when the liability shift changes to whoever has the safest transaction, the fraud goes to the other party. So if you have a chip and pin card, but you have a MagStripe reader, Obviously, if there's any fraud, it's going to go to the merchant. But if the merchant's ready and you're not, that fraud's going to come back to you. And that's October of next year. So it may take five to years, five to ten years to get fully integrated. I mean, there's still people with knuckle buster type of, you know, yeah. readers. Right? So that's, there's, I mean, those are never going to go away. The, the small shops, but the large retailers, like I said, the top 24, they're going to be compliant. So, and the key is not to wait to get in queue, you know, next year. Get your plan together, have a strategy, work with co-op, work with whatever provider you have, because here's what's going to happen. It's like trying to get a hotel room at the Super Bowl. If the date's coming up October 2015, people are going to try to get in a room all together at the same time, and you're going to have a queuing problem. That's just inevitable that's going to happen. So, Well, uh, again, with the five to ten years, though, isn't having a physical card going to be a nuisance for that market? So the millennials, do they want to carry a plastic card? Yeah, I mean, I mean, they don't. They just want to take their phone somewhere. Right, but obviously there's, I mean, not just the millennials. There's another big chunk of people that are still out there. Millennials may want more mobile functionality that's secure, but it's probably, you know, you really have to have two pieces. And, and that's just my opinion. I mean, it's a matter of choice if you want to wait for mobile and tokenization to occur, but that could be a lot longer. And as we just heard with, you know, she was saying, Sue was saying here about the QR codes, there's a lot of moving parts still on the mobile in the mobile device side, and that's what we're talking about today. There's lots of options. EMV is an older technology. It's been around since 1995. Europe went live in 2000, uh, Canada 2008. And then once you hit about 60% penetration, it's pretty much you've hit the peak of, of, of where fraud's going to start dropping and your main players have actually integrated and become compliant. So I think that, yeah, it may take five years for you all the way to get down to the mom and pop shops but majority, 90% will be compliant probably between next year and 2017. Because you have next year uh, for issuers and merchants, 2016 for ATMs, and then automated uh, fuel dispensers is October of 2017. So I would say the next, you know, 2015, 16, 17, you're gonna see a, a mass movement. And it'll probably be by sectors, like I said, the educators, uh, military, people that have uh, commercial travelers, anyone that goes, I mean, you go across the border to Vancouver for vacation and you're sitting in a restaurant. It happened last year and I happen to have a chip card and the guy comes out with his reader and says, chip, I'm thinking, wait a minute, he doesn't mean potato chips, he means chip card. I give him my card, it never left the table. You know, the card never went away from me. Uh, and the same would have been the same if I had a mobile device. I could have just tapped it and paid for it. So, you know, both are necessary when they become equally important and when, you know, mobile takes over, who knows? There will always be something in the future, but we've waited 40 years, you know, using this, get back to this. I mean, it's, it's really time. And I think cards are going to be out there for a while, and they're not going away. Cash is still there. Checks are still there. So I think you really do need to have an EMV card and a mobile plan. So that's what I was just trying to drop a hint today. You can give her a card too, Chris. Anyone else? All right, my name is Kevin Rowland, and if you have any questions, please see Chris Insley or me. I'd be glad to talk to you and share with you our perspective beyond this uh, conversation today. Thanks, Chris.
Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, you bet. Appreciate it.